Hello and welcome back to another episode of UFC by the Numbers. This is episode number four and let's get right into it. UFC 4 Revenge of the Warriors took place December 16th, 1994 in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the Expo Center Pavilion. Fan attendance was about 5,800 and it did a buy rate of about 120,000 pay-per-views. Not as many familiar faces in the commentary booth this time. We did once again have NFL legend Jim Brown, but Brian Kilmeade was demoted to co-anchor and is really only seen in the background of the event. And Ben Perry ultimately got the sack. They were both replaced by Bruce Beck and Jeff Blatnick. Bruce Beck was a New York broadcast legend. From 1982 to 1994, he was a staff broadcaster with the MSG Network. He was also the play-by-play announcer for college football and basketball, as well as professional and Golden Gloves boxing. And over the years, he would cover a multitude of events for NBC, including six Super Bowls, the World Series, the NBA Finals, the Stanley Cup Finals, NCAA Final Four, as well as the 2002 to 2018 Olympic Games. This guy really put Brian Kilmeade to shame, I tell you what. And this wasn't his only foray into MSG. MMA. He was also the host of Yama Pit Fighting. Jeff Blatnick. He was a three time All American wrestler, and after winning national titles in NCAA Division II, he qualified for the 1980 Olympic team, but did not get a chance to compete because the USA had boycotted the Games that year. In 1982, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, prompting the removal of his spleen and appendix. After radiation therapy helped to hold the cancer in remission, Blatnik competed in and won a gold medal in the 1984 Olympic Games held in Los Angeles, California. Him and his teammate Steve Frazier were the first Americans to ever win gold in Olympic Greco-Roman wrestling history. He was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 1999 and was heavily involved in the development of the modern rules of the sport of MMA. With the help of John McCarthy and former UFC matchmaker Joe Silva, Blatnik created a manual of policies, procedures, codes of conduct, and rules, many of which are still being used today. And Blatnik was also credited with giving the sport the name of mixed martial arts. And the G-Man, Rich Goins, was still your ring announcer, but with a new, terrible mustache. And of course, your referee is still Big John McCarthy, Joseph S. Swanick was still your cage-side doctor, and Leon Tabs was the event's official cutman. And there was still no rounds, no time limits, and no judges and definitely no weight classes. The event was still using eight competitors, with the winner now receiving $64,000. After tournament alternate Steve Jenham won UFC 3 by winning just one bout, the final, alternates now had to win a pre-fight bout to qualify for their role as an alternate. Kevin Rosier some of you may remember Kevin from UFC 1, where he lost to Gerard Gordeau in the semifinals. He was a professional kickboxer with a record of 66 and 8, with 66 knockouts. This would be his final UFC appearance, and he would retire from MMA in 2000 with a record of 2 and 6, fighting fellow UFC vet Dan Severn on two occasions. He had also had a 12 year career as a professional boxer, which he held a 7 and 17 record, and he also ended up retiring from boxing in 2001.
Joe the Ghetto Man Charles from Culver City, California. He was an accomplished high school wrestler and judoka who did have aspirations of competing in the Olympics. However, a forklift accident suffered in 1982 would rob him of that opportunity. Following the accident and fearing that he would never be able to walk again, Charles embarked on a heavy regimen of exercise, claiming to have done a thousand sit-ups a day just to keep himself motivated. By 1986, he was back to the competitive martial arts. In your first alternate bout of the night, we had Joe Charles versus Kevin Rozier. It looks like Kevin tries to emulate the scene from Kickboxer with Tong Po kicking the support pillars, but it doesn't quite have the same effect though. Kevin also has a big time mullet in his promo, but when he enters the octagon, it looks like they literally just took a pair of scissors to him just before he walked out. There's still clumps of hair, it's very uneven, looks a bit odd to say the least. And Joe Charles comes out with a very interesting outfit for himself, very fancy. Kevin has also slimmed down tremendously and looks in a lot better shape than he did in his first UFC appearance. And this is not the first time they've had Octagon Girls, but it's the first time they've been named as such from what I can tell. Charles comes out and lands a quick right followed by a solid 1-2 which puts Rozier down. Charles jumps on Rozier and gets him to expose his back and quickly applies an armbar and Rozier taps. It's all over in 14 seconds and that's the fastest finish we've had in all the competitions so far. And Joe Charles has secured a place as an alternate in the tournament. Marcus Bossett, third degree black belt in Shorin Ryu Karate. He claims to have received his initial karate black belt while training in Japan and holding a black belt in Shorinji Ryu Jiu Jitsu. And it was this interest in finding a new and better expressions of martial arts that led him to the UFC and ended up opening his own karate school and entered into a series of kickboxing competitions. Eldo Diaz. Javier, born in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, he had a nickname of the Iron Hand. He was the first and arguably the only capoeira purist to enter the UFC. This is also his only MMA event. And in your second alternate bout, we have Marcus Bossett versus Eldo Diaz Javier. So unfortunately, I was unable to find footage of this fight on any corner of the internet, wiped from existence. If anyone out there knows where to find it, please let me know, because I searched high and low. The only footage that I could find was in the actual UFC event footage itself, where they showed a brief highlight of the fight, which basically consisted of Marcus hammering Eldo with a couple lefts and rights, followed by a big uppercut and some nice hooks against the cage, and Eldo goes down and Big John steps in to save him, and Marcus Bossett secures his place as the second alternate in the tournament. Guy Mesger, born in Houston, Texas, he was a collegiate wrestler and black belt karateka. He was the 1993 and 94 full contact karate champion. His MMA training was based almost entirely with the Lion's Den and Ken Shamrock throughout his career, with his kickboxing training coming under Billy Jackson. He also holds a six degree black belt in Taekwondo. He would also go on to have a very long career in MMA, right, not only in the UFC, but internationally as well. Jason Fairn from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. He was a black belt in Aiki Jitsu under his father, David Fairn, and claimed black belts in Taekwondo as well as Karate. Fairn had a reputation as an underground club fighter, reportedly having won 33 bare knuckle matches. That reputation brought him to California, where he worked as a celebrity bodyguard and occasional stuntman. This was his only UFC event. And in the final alternate bout of the evening, we had Guy Mesger versus Jason Fairn. Two-time UFC veteran Pat Smith is in Jason's corner. This fight wasn't to find another alternate for this UFC event, 
This was for the chance to compete at UFC 5. And both guys, as you'll see, have very long hair and ponytails, and they had apparently made a gentleman's agreement in the back that neither would pull the other's hair. Both men come out to the center of the octagon, and Fair starts taunting Metzger by pointing at his chin and, and trying to bait him into throwing a punch. Fair then moves in on Metzger and lands a few punches, pushing him up against the cage. Guy reverses and lands a few strikes of his own. Both trade groin shots up against the cage. Metzger lands a few punches in the clinch and forces Jason to step back, but Jason comes right back with a big right hand that drops Metzger momentarily. Farron jumps on him and looks for a guillotine choke, then it's a good knee to Metzger's head. The guy is able to secure a body lock as they stand up and takes Jason right down and ends up in half guard. And eventually Metzger slides right into mount. Jason tries to buck and roll Metzger. Metzger is just too strong in the mount, and Metzger is eventually able to posture up and land some big ground and pound until Pat Smith eventually throws in the towel, and Guy Metzger has secured his spot on the UFC 5 card. Hoist Gracie from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, the obvious UFC 1 and 2 champion, but was forced to throw in the towel in UFC 3 before his fight with Harold Howard due to the strenuous battle that he had with Kimo Leopoldo in the first round. And I believe that the name of this event was kind of catered towards Hoist coming back and regaining the crown, Revenge of the Warriors. Ron Van Cleef Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York City, he is still the oldest competitor ever to compete inside the UFC. Van Cleef began his martial arts career competing in both full contact and non-contact karate tournaments in New York and then internationally, going on to win several national and then world championships. In 1971, Van Cleef created his own style of martial arts called Chinese Goju, attempting to unify Japanese style of Goju Ryu with his roots in Chinese martial arts. He also holds black belts in karate, Jiu Jitsu, Aiki Jitsu, Kung Fu, and Zen Jitsu. Van Cleef was also a martial arts B movie star in the 70s. His first acting job came when he was selected to star in the 1974 Hong Kong film The Black Dragon, aka Super Dragon. Cleef's film roles earned him the nickname The Black Dragon, and the name inspired the titles of many films like The Black Dragon's Revenge, aka The Black Dragon Revenges the Death of Bruce Lee, and The Way of the Black Dragon and Enter Another Dragon, and was the fight choreographer for the 1985 film the last dragon he also appeared in many other films over his time and would go on to provide various voiceover roles for the international television series kung fu and the first quarterfinal fight of the evening is hoist gracie versus ron van cleef Hoist again gets a, another type of showcase matchup for the opening round. They already fought Art Jimerson and Minoki Ichihara. Van Cleef comes out and throws a quick kick which misses. Hoist takes advantage and secures a body lock and gets the takedown right into side control. Van Cleef obviously has very little knowledge on the ground, but does attempt a few knees off his back, but Gracie eventually slides into mount. Hoist easily controls the position and patiently waits for an opening, landing a few elbows to the top of the head, posturing up and landing a few good shots. Eventually forcing Van Cleef to give up his back and Gracie immediately starts looking for the choke and eventually gets it. Van Cleef taps, Big John steps in but Hoist won't let go and Van Cleef taps again and Big John has to pull Hoist off of Ron. Not very nice from Hoist but he is going to move on to the semi-finals. Keith the Giant Killer Hackney from Roselle, Illinois, a returning competitor from the UFC 3 tournament, was forced to withdraw due to a hand injury sustained in his win against Emmanuel Yarbrough. He was a Taekwondo and Kempo Karate black belt. His black belt came under Tom Saviano's White Tiger Kempo system. Joe Sun. Sun was born in South Korea and moved his family to California at a very early age. He had appeared in UFC 3 as Kimo Leopoldo's corner man and agitator. He was a self-professed Taekwondo black belt, but at the event, he's apparently a Joe Son Do practitioner. Sun may be best known though for his role in the 1997 movie Austin Powers International Man of Mystery as Random Task. This was his only major film role. Sun had appeared in several low budget action films including Joshua Tree, Blood Fist 5, Bad Blood, Shoot Fight 
Fighter Fight to the Death and actually had a leading role as the main villain in the sequel to Shoot Fighter, Shoot Fighter 2. However though, in October 2008, Sun was charged by California authorities in relation to his participation in the 1990 gang rape and faced a maximum sentence of 275 years to life if convicted. Before the jury selection began for his trial in, in early August 2011, the initial charges against Sun were dropped, having expired due to the statute of limitations. Sun was then charged with conspiracy to commit torture and murder, crimes of which have no statute of limitations. In late August of that year, Sun was found guilty of one felony count of torture, and on September 19, 2011, he was sentenced to seven years to life in prison. But his story doesn't end there. In October 2011, Sun was accused of killing his cellmate, Michael Thomas Graham, and on September 13, 2013, Sun was officially charged with Graham's murder. At his trial in 2017, he was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and received a 27-year your sentence. The second quarterfinal match saw Keith Hackney take on Joe Sun. Joe Sun with one of the creepiest promos I've ever seen, but not unexpected from a total piece of shit. Sun comes out carrying the cross like Kimo in UFC 3. Pat Smith is also in the corner of Joe Sun, birds of a feather, and all that stuff. We'll get into that a little later on. Joe Sun immediately takes the center of the octagon. They circle each other and Hackney throws a few strikes with just miss before landing a nice outside low kick. Sun tries to taunt Hackney into hitting him. And Keith lands another low calf kick and rushes in with a few punches backing Sun up against the cage. And Joe Sun actually ends up taking Keith down with a quick entry to a body lock and just muscles Hackney down to the ground. Hackney tries to wrestle out but he doesn't have the underhook, allowing Sun to get the front headlock position. Keith starts trying to get to his feet and Sun attempts a guillotine and then switches to an arm in guillotine once they get to their feet. Hackney lands a good groin shot to Joe Sun, who in turn pushes him halfway across the octagon right into the fence. And then Sun really starts to sell out for the guillotine. Hackney is able to tie up that leg and sweep it out from Joe Sun, taking them to the ground. And once they hit the floor, Keith is able to hop over to the opposite side of the choke, relieving the pressure, and starts to deliver some ruthless groin shots to Joe Sun, which are probably well deserved. Then Keith gets Joe Sun in some type of trachea hold and starts to pull down his shorts. And Sun taps from one of those two, and Keith Hackney is moving on to the semifinals. Melton Bowen, Jamaican born but lived and trained in Miami for his whole life. He started his pro career in boxing in 1987, and he had fought some very credible names in his boxing time, such as Carl the Truth Williams, Tony Tubbs, and future heavyweight champion Shannon Briggs. Later in life, he was interviewed on Channel 7 News Miami regarding the Miami zombie killer, Rudy Eugene, in 2007. Bowen said that Eugene threatened to beat him up at a local flea market in a dispute over music. Bowen said he knocked Eugene out with a single punch. This was Bowen's only MMA appearance. Steve Jenner from Omaha, Nebraska, the returning UFC 3 champ. However, that title is probably a bit disputed due to the fact that he had only won one fight that evening, that being the finals against Harold Howard. And it was Jenham's tournament victory in UFC 3 that caused the UFC to not only reinsert alternate bouts into the schedule, but to expand the number of alternates from two to six. The third quarterfinal match saw Melton Bowen versus Steve Jenham. Steve Jenham, the returning champion from UFC 3. Bowen is the first UFC competitor to wear MMA style gloves in the octagon. So a pretty historic moment here, somewhat goes unnoticed. Both guys spend some time circling each other and throwing out a few feints and range finding strikes. Jenham ducks under a hook and looks for a takedown, but Bowen has some pretty good takedown defense and avoids being taken down. But Jenham is persistent and drives Melton against the cage. Bowen still defends the takedown and lands a few short shots to the back of Steve's head. But Jenham sweeps out the leg and secures the takedown right into Melton. Steve postures up and lands some good ground and pound. And Melton at this point is just trying to punch from the bottom, not really trying to escape. Trying to get onto a hip or secure Steve's upper body. Jenham lands some more hard strikes and a headbutt. Melton is eventually able to get to his hip and uses the fence to pull himself back up to his feet. Jenham pushes Bowen back against the cage and Bowen lands a nice uppercut. But Jenham hip tosses him right back down to the ground lands inside control and moves right into Melton. Melton tries to
tries to land a few punches from the bottom but is unsuccessful. Zenon lands a few solid strikes and looks for an Americana but he can't get it and lands another good shot to the face of Bowen. Both guys are looking very tired right now. This has been a pretty high pace for both of them. Melton extending his arms to push Jenim off is a bad idea, really exposing himself to a possible armbar submission, which Jenim eventually takes and finishes the fight via armbar. Bowen showed a lot of heart in this fight and no quit at all, but Jenim is moving on to defend his UFC crown. Dan Severn. Severn was born and raised in Coldwater, Michigan, multiple time D1 All-American and NCAA tournament finalist, and was the UFC's first truly world-class wrestler. Severn was a two-time All-American at Arizona State University and is in their Wrestling Hall of Fame. He had 13 national AAU wrestling championships from 1982 to 1994 and was the 1984 and 1998 Summer Olympic team alternate. Severn originally started competing in professional wrestling in 1992 for the UWFI, the Universal Wrestling Federation International. In his debut match on November 25th, 1992, he defeated Yuku Miyato. He then went on to defeat the likes of Yoji Anjo and Kiyoshi Tamura. On January 28th, 1994, Seven began to wrestle for the All-American Pro Wrestling, the AAPW. He then began to branch out to other promotions such as the Border City Wrestling and Continental Championship Wrestling. Anthony Mycias from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Mycias was a Muay Thai fighter and I really can't find too much on him from before this event. He would however go on to have a very long MMA career and this won't be his only appearance inside the octagon. In the last quarterfinal match of the evening, we see Anthony Mycias versus Dan Severn. Anthony getting a lot of love from the hometown crowd, and there's a pretty noticeable size difference. Anthony starts by landing some nice kicks at Dan's lead leg, but he fakes one and Dan uses the opportunity to shoot a double leg. But Severn can't complete the takedown and a scramble ensues. Anthony's showing some real good initial takedown defense. Severn wrestles up and takes a few elbows to the back of the head before Severn hits him with a beautiful belly to back suplex, or souple as Bill Blatnick says, and another even harder one. And on the ground, Dan starts grinding on Anthony, putting all his weight on him, grinding his forearms into his face and looking for a choke. And Dan makes Macias tap from a one arm choke. And Dan Severn is moving on to the semifinals. Your first semi-final of the evening is Hoist Gracie versus Keith Hackney. Hoist starts off by throwing a few kicks and Hackney looks for some of his own. Hoist tries to secure a takedown off of it, but Keith scoots back and lands a few punches to the face of Hoist. Hoist narrowly misses with a head kick and Gracie starts to close the space between them and shoots for a takedown, but Hackney with a great sprawl to defend. Eventually Hoist is able to get Keith up against the cage and looks for another takedown landing a few knees in the process, but Keith is showing really good takedown defense so far, and Hackney lands a few punches of his own. Hoist then gets Keith in a sort of tie clinch and lands some good knees to the face and head. Gracie then with a collar tie and a few more knees, Keith throws back an uppercut, and Hoist has to resort to pulling guard to get the fight to the ground, looking for a possible triangle or omoplata, but Keith is able to avoid the initial submission attempts. Hoist pulls Keith back into his guard, and Hoist starts looking to land some short punches from inside the guard. Hackney is able to posture up and lands a few punches of his own, but he's still in a bad spot here, and Hoist is guard, and Grace is controlling his wrists. A few more punches and elbows by Hoist from the bottom, and Gracie quickly transitions to an arm bar, and Keith is forced to tap. Keith showed some real good takedown defense in this fight, but just wasn't able to survive once Hoist got into the ground and Hoist is moving on to his third finals in four UFCs. And in your second semifinal, we see alternate Marcus Bossett versus Dan Severn. Marcus had won his spot as we saw earlier in the alternate bouts, but won a coin toss to be the first alternate, taking the place of Steve Jenner. So the returning champion is not going to be able to defend his crown. Severn starts by taking the center of the octagon and starts trying to cut Marcus off at every angle. But Marcus lands a beautiful body kick, looks for another and misses, and tries to recover with a spinning back kick, but Severn drops levels, 
wraps up Boss's legs and takes him right down into side control and effortlessly moves right into mount and uses all of his weight to really smother Marcus, putting a lot of heavy top pressure on him. And Severin is able to lock up a mounted head and arm choke and Marcus taps and Dan is moving on to the finals to fight Hoist Gracie in what could be a very interesting chess match between the two grapplers. And in the final bout of UFC 4, we see Hoist Gracie versus Dan Severn. Severn coming in with an 80 pound weight advantage over Hoist, which could end up being the difference in this fight. It has a very long random cut to an older lady cape side, not too sure who she is. Gracie starts by attacking the lead leg of Severn, and Dan shoots a double leg and easily completes the takedown. Severn again using a lot of heavy top pressure, looking to wear down Hoist. Gracie uses butterfly hooks to elevate Severn and try to sweep him, but it doesn't work. Severn continues the heavy shoulder pressure, really trying to make Hoist uncomfortable. Hoist starts looking for an Ezekiel choke. Severn postures up and lands a few punches. And this would be the position for the majority of the fight. Dan being on top, applying a lot of pressure, just being a real 260 pound weight on top of Hoist for most of the fight. Hoist starts to open up his guard a bit more, controlling the left arm of Severn and shoots up a triangle. Briefly locks it in, but Severn postures up and drives his weight into Hoist, forcing him to abandon the choke. Severn still just applying heavy top pressure and grinding into the face of Hoist. Gracie again controls the left arm and shoots another triangle and slowly starts locking it up before eventually fully locking it in. Severn tries to escape, moving side to side and again trying to posture up into Hoist, but it's of no use, it's in too deep and Severn's forced to tap. And Hoist wins his third UFC in four events, all by submission. And that does it for UFC 4 Revenge of the Warriors. Hoist Gracie regains his crown as the UFC champ. There are some great fights, some new faces, and I can't wait to do the next one. Until then, peace.